rear axle assembly came out of a car that was used to launch a boat. The owner backed out a bit too far and some water got into the rear axle. He neglected to have the contaminated lube flushed out, so now Larry's overhauling the unit while Hank's giving him some tips. Boy, these gears are really worn. Looks like we're going to have to replace just about everything in this differential. Yes, but it's not always this easy to find the cause of trouble. So as you work on this job, I'll point out what to check if the trouble wasn't so obvious. Now, right now, for example, you should check ring gear runout with a dial indicator before you disassemble the differential, or you might miss some good clues to trouble. However, this differential has some side play, so it would be impossible to check ring gear runout on it. You're right, Hank. And that brings up an important point. Always check for side play with a dial indicator before measuring runout, because runout can't be measured accurately when there's any side play. Tech's right, Larry. And if there's been side play for any appreciable length of time, the pinion and ring gear will be worn, and you'll have to replace them. Okay, I'll remember that point. Now, after you've checked to be certain there's no side play, Measure the runout through several complete rotations of the ring gear to be sure of an accurate reading. Ring gear runout should not exceed five thousandths. If it does, mark the gear and the mounting flange to show the location of the point of highest runout to help you spot the cause of the trouble later. Before you remove the two bearing caps, always be sure that the caps and the carrier housing are marked to show the proper location of the caps. It's important that they be reinstalled in the same positions. We won't have to use the housing spreader tool to remove this differential. The bearings are so badly shot that there's no longer any preload. But since it's usually necessary to spread the housing, I better show you how to use the spreader. To begin with, you should never spread the housing more than 20 thousandths, just enough to remove the differential. If you spread the housing over 20 thousandths, you might distort it permanently. So, to control the spread accurately, you'll need to use a dial indicator with the spreader tool. Be sure to mount the indicator to one of the bolt holes in the housing. Don't mount it to the spreader by mistake, or you won't get a true indication of the amount the housing is spread. Spread the housing between 15 and 20 thousandths, and remove the dial indicator so you won't accidentally damage it when you're removing the differential. The differential bearing cups have a tendency to stick in the housing counterbores, so you'll have to jar the differential assembly to loosen the bearing cups. I use an old axle shaft for this job. Place one end of the old axle shaft under the edge of the ring gear and hold the other end of the shaft so it isn't resting against the spreader. Now you'll see why in a moment. Bump the shaft against the spreader tool to jar the differential assembly loose. Once the differential is jarred loose in this manner, you can lift it out without any difficulty. And I suppose that when you remove the bearings and spacers, it's advisable to keep those from one side of the differential separate from those of the other side. Yes, it's a good idea to tie them to their bearing caps, so you'll be able to tell which side all these parts came from. If you found excessive ring gear run out, now would be the time to check case flange run out and find out if the trouble was in the ring gear the case flange, or the attachment of the gear to the flange. If you have to check case flange runout, don't loosen the spreader until after you've removed the ring gear from the differential case and check the runout. You'll need to have the case spread open to put the differential case back in place with its bearings and spacers to make this measurement. When you remove the ring gear bolts, remember that they have left-hand threads. And before you separate the gear from the case, Make sure the gear and the case are both mocked to show gear position on the case. Okay, Tech. Now what should I do after I've removed the ring gear? Next, you'd have to put the case back in the housing with the bearings and the spacers installed, Larry. When you're sliding these parts in place, don't let the bearing cups or spacers become cocked or you'll have trouble. After you've loosened the spreader and mounted the dial indicator, measure case flange runout while rotating the case several turns. If runout is over three thousandths on any flange, replace the case. If flange runout is within limits, inspect both the flange and the gear face carefully to see if the excessive ring gear runout was caused by a small metal chip or dirt caught between the flange and the gear. 
The high runout marks you made earlier will show you where to look. I know it's important to inspect all the differential parts after they've been cleaned, but what do you pay particular attention to, Hank? Well, for one thing, I check all gears carefully. I make sure the gear teeth have smooth, unbroken surfaces without excessive wear. And the contact wear pattern should be uniform on all teeth. I inspect all bearings closely for the cause of failure. If bearings have a galled, chewed up appearance with a blue color, it probably means that they weren't lubricated properly, while flaked bearing surfaces indicate that the bearing was overloaded. It's very important that no small metal chips or dirt remain in the bearing counterbores in the carrier housing. If a counterbore isn't perfectly clean and smooth, you'll have trouble installing the bearing correctly. I'd like to add that cleanliness is important throughout the entire rear axle and differential, not just in the housing counterbores, Larry. And that job you're working on could be loaded with small metal chips from damaged bearings and gear teeth. So be sure to do a thorough job of cleaning everything that you're going to reuse. Don't worry, Tech, I won't forget. Now, how about both of you standing by until I finish disassembling this job and get all the new parts it needs? Okay, I picked up all the replacement parts for this job and I've just finished putting the differential assembly together. That's fine, Larry. I've got just one question. Did you talk down the ring gear bolts to the proper value? I sure did, and I tightened them all evenly, a bit at a time, too. Now, how about some advice on finishing up this job? Sure, to begin with, there are two important pinion adjustments to be made. Pinion depth and pinion preload. Now, the first adjustment Hey, is... aren't you forgetting that you've got to select the correct differential bearing preload spacers first? <laughs> nope. I learned a new streamlined procedure at the training center a couple of weeks ago. Now we install and adjust the pinion before establishing carrier bearing preload. You'll see how this saves time. Now, but as I was saying, the first adjustment is pinion depth. The rear axle gauge set provides a convenient means of gauging the thickness of the pinion spacer washer for proper pinion depth. So, after you've installed the bearing cups with this set, Leave the tool in the carrier, loosen the tool compression nut, and retighten it enough to give a 15 to 25 inch pound drag when you turn the tool. This preloads the tool and sets its position accurately so it can be used to select the right pinion spacer washer. Attach the gauge block to the tool shaft and install the crossbore arbor. Then select a pinion spacer washer that just fits between the arbor and the gauge block with a definite drag. Never attach the gauge block on the tool shaft before you put the shaft in the carrier housing. You could damage the gauge set or select the wrong spacer. As I remember, that spacer washer is the correct one to use only if the pinion is marked zero. What if the pinion has some other marking? Well, you've got to consider pinion markings when making your final spacer selection. For example, if a pinion is marked plus two, choose a spacer that's two thousandths thinner than the one originally selected. Oh, yes. And if it's marked with a minus number, it means that the final spacer should be that many thousandths thicker. Right? Right, Larry. This is one case where plus means subtract and minus means add. Right now, we've got another selection to make. We have to select someone to turn this record. Okay, you two experts. I've selected the right size spacer washer and I've removed the pinion bearing installing tool and gauge parts. What's the next step in installing and adjusting the pinion? Well, next we set pinion bearing preload. Lubricate all bearing surfaces with light oil and install all the pinion parts except the oil seal, since the seal would create extra drag on the pinion shaft and result in a faulty preload reading. Pinion preload is determined by the thickness of the preload spacer. Now, I've found that the original preload spacer is usually the best one to start with when adjusting pinion preload. Be sure to tighten the pinion nut to at least 240 foot-pounds, or preload will be affected. Right, and your preload readings will be accurate only if the nose of the carrier is pointed straight up. Also, remember to rotate the pinion a few times in both directions 
to align the bearing rollers before you take a preload reading. The correct preload for new bearings is 15 to 25 inch pounds. If the old bearings are still good and you're reusing them, the correct preload is 5 to 13 inch pounds. Now that's because used bearings become polished in use, reducing friction. If you use the specifications for new bearings on used bearings, the adjustment would be too tight and the bearings could fail. It seems to me there's an awful lot of importance placed on these preload specifications. Why is preload so important? Well, preload must be high enough to hold the bearings in firm contact and keep the gears aligned under the stresses of operating loads. But if there's too much preload, excessive heat will be generated and the bearing will fail prematurely. On the other hand, too little preload will let the gears run out of proper position and result in gear noise and gear and bearing failure. And keep this in mind. A bearing that's preloaded too much won't make noise until it's burned out. I'll remember that, Tech. Got any more tips on preload? Yes, here's one. If the torque readings vary when you're checking pinion preload, it's a sign that the bearings are dirty or you forgot to oil them. Good point, Tech. When you've set pinion bearing preload correctly and installed a pinion oil seal, remember to retighten the pinion nut to at least 240 foot-pounds. Then you're ready to install the differential case and ring gear. Shall I spread the carrier housing? No, it's not necessary at this time. Just put the differential and its bearings in the housing with two of the thinnest bearing spacers available. If the edge of a bearing spacer is chamfered on only one side, Make sure you install the chamfered side outward toward the carrier housing. Remember that, Larry. It's important. Since you're starting with the thinnest spacers available, 254 thousandths thick, the differential case won't be tight in the housing. It'll have some side play. The next step is to measure this side play with two sets of feeler gauges at the side of the case nearest the pinion. Use blades of equal thickness. Be sure that both sets are all the way in, so that the tips are positioned between the spacer and the casting. Rotate the differential a few times in both directions with the feeler gauges in place to align the bearing rollers. You can then fit still thicker feeler blades in the pinion side. If you do much differential work, you'll save time by making gauges out of a set of bearing spaces of graduated sizes to use in place of the feeler gauges. The tails are in the reference book. I see. These spacer gauges or the feeler gauges will tell me one thing. They'll tell me how much I have to add to the spacers to eliminate all side play. But what's next? Install the bearing cap on the ring gear side. Snug the cap bolts down enough to hold the differential in place while you measure gear backlash. Find the point of minimum backlash by measuring backlash at four ring gear teeth, about 90 degrees apart. Mark the point of minimum backlash. You'll use this mark later. Incidentally, these backlash measurements will tell you if ring gear and case flange run out is okay. There shouldn't be a difference of more than five thousandths from the highest backlash reading to the lowest. Remember that, Larry. It's a quick way to be sure you've mounted the ring gear to the case flange correctly. Right. I won't forget. Now, what comes next after we found out what our minimum backlash is? Well, this chart in the reference book will tell us how much change we have to make in the thickness of the spacers on both sides to end up with the specified amount of backlash and bearing preload. I see. From here on, it's just a matter of simple arithmetic to determine the final spacer thickness for both sides. Nothing to it. I've selected the spacers already. You've really got to be fussy about your measurements on this job. Always mic every spacer you use to be sure of its thickness. And don't use a feeler gauge that's creased, worn, or damaged in any other way that would foul up your measurements. What's next, Hank? Well, now's the time to spread the carrier housing. And with this new procedure, the odds are that this is the only time you'll have to do it during reassembly of this differential. I got the dial indicator set up to be sure I don't spread the housing more than 20 thousandths. That's good, Larry. And don't keep the housing spread any longer than necessary. A sharp blow when the housing is spread could cause it to take a set. I'll remember that, Tech. 
Be sure to hold the differential, the bearing cups, and the two new spacers all together in one sandwich when you slide them in place. Don't try to install them one piece at a time. They won't fit that way. After you've removed the spreader, make a final backlash test with the dial indicator. If all the adjustments are correct, minimum backlash should be between four and seven thousandths, and maximum backlash should be no more than five thousandths above the minimum backlash. Well, that's the story on the new procedure for reassembling the differential, Larry. It's sure a quick way to do the job. Does it eliminate the need for the red lead test, Hank? Oh, no, absolutely not. I still use the red lead test as a double check to be sure the gear tooth contact pattern is as it should be. Now, this test will verify that the pinion depth of mesh is set correctly and that backlash is properly adjusted. To make the gear tooth pattern test, brush red lead evenly onto the ring gear teeth. Your red lead must be smooth and just slightly moist, a bit thicker than toothpaste. If it's too thin, it will run and fill in the tooth contact pattern. The gear tooth pattern should look like this, neither too high nor too low on the gear teeth. Yeah, but suppose the pattern doesn't come out like that. What do I do then? If the pattern appears wrong the first time you try the red lead test, repeat the test before you decide to change any adjustments. It takes some practice to do this test correctly, so the improper pattern could be the result of your technique and not because of an improper adjustment. If the pattern still isn't right, you'll have to decide what's wrong and how to correct it. You'll find some helpful ideas on this subject in the reference book for this session. I'll remember to use that advice, Tech. Now, since this gear tooth pattern is okay, do you two guys have any tips to help me finish this job? Well, here's a point to watch. Before you install the cover, check to be sure the surface is flat. Distorted edges won't seal tightly. And torque the cover bolts evenly to no more than 20 foot-pounds. Over-torquing the cover bolts can distort the cover and cause a leak. Since the rear axle ball bearings were okay on this job, I didn't have to remove them from the axle shafts. But next time, I might not be so lucky. So, do you have any suggestions that'll make removal of axle bearings easier? Oh, sure. Here's how I handle that little chore. First, I loosen the bearing collar by deeply notching the collar across the full width of its outer diameter surface in one or two places with a chisel. This increases the inside diameter of the collar enough so you can slip it off the shaft. After removing the collar, the bearing can be pressed off the shaft, although it's impossible to remove the bearing without damaging it. Be sure you don't damage the axle shaft, though. If you nick or damage the axle shaft, replace it. Even a small nick can cause shaft failure. And never try to remove the bearing by heating it. You'll affect the heat treating and weaken the shaft. Thanks. Those tips should make rear axle bearing removal a lot easier. Good. But hold up just a moment before you install that axle assembly on the car. You'll find that it's easier to fill the differential with the proper amount of the correct lubricant before you install it on the car. In fact, on a frame contact hoist, you wouldn't even be able to get the full amount of lube in the housing after it's installed. And when you install the axle, be careful to tighten the U-bolts to no more than 45 foot-pounds. If you go over this value, you might distort the bearing bores in the axle housing, leading to early bearing failure. Okay, Hank. I'll watch out for those points as I finish this job. I hope these tips will help you, Larry. Just remember that it takes time and patience to service a differential properly. You've got to adjust bearing preload and gear contact precisely if you want to avoid comebacks. That's right, Hank. I couldn't have said it better myself. I'm sure that Larry and every other technician who uses the information in the reference book will consistently turn out a top-notch job of differential service. Thank <laughs> you.